microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations, and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening, and welcome to News from Neptune for the 32nd week of 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio station WEFT, and then when I was censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does in fact seem to be what WEFT by its charter is supposed to be, quote, an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoak. Our format will be to take turns introducing a topic or a comment or an outrage from the week's news, which the other two will comment on or raise a question about, and we'll try to go around several times. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, Either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is Friday, August 12th, 2011. This Sunday, this coming Sunday, is the anniversary in 1935 of President Roosevelt signing the Social Security Act. It guaranteed the depth of the Depression, it guaranteed persons, it guaranteed pensions to people retiring at 65 with contributions from both employees and employers. It also provided financial aid to dependent children, blind people, and established a system of unemployment insurance. Now, today, uh, in these dark days, uh, in the midst of a Great Recession, instead of the Great Depression, we have uh, the anti-FDR, the reverse Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Obama, who wants to undo some of that Social Security Act, uh, as the largest corporations uh, in this country have been desiring for years. Uh, it's not an accident that it's a Democratic president who is in a position to undo what a Democratic president put in place. George W. Bush, in fact, if you remember, on his reelection, set out to reform Social Security. Reform means to reduce uh, the benefits uh, that people get from Social Security, uh, and wasn't able to do it because of opposition. Well, uh, Obama, uh, the second team was sent in. Uh, Obama, working for uh, his backers in Wall Street, uh, looks like being able, in fact, to do it with his new cat food commission, uh, the super congress that uh, is considering these matters right now. Uh, there is opposition, and the opposition should be much more serious than it is. Uh, it's the fact that the uh, Democrats have once more gone into the tank on this matter. Uh, that means that the opposition isn't there. They could leave it there, even some who do, some who've gone into the tank on other occasions. I'm thinking of Barney Frank, uh, Democratic representative from Massachusetts, um, who uh, in a an amazing interview with NPR this week, uh, where NPR busily began, uh, bu busily insisted on putting forth the orthodoxy about how entitlements, that is, social supports, must be cut. Uh, Frank, in his straightforward way, says, quote, I'm not going to tell an 80-year-old woman living on $19,000 a year that she gets no cost of living, or that a man who has been doing physical labor all his life, and now at a 67-year-old retirement, which is where Social Security will be soon, that he has to work for five more years. Okay. I mean, if they had, the Democrats had been willing to put uh, a real face on this, they might have been able to make something of it. Uh, and it still may happen. I mean, what may happen, of course, is the rejection of the Democrats, uh, both at the uh, presidential level and elsewhere in the coming election, because of their failure to uh, defend uh, these social supports, indeed, the direct attack that the Obama administration uh, has um, uh, issued uh, in regard to the social supports. Uh, to give you an example of what the uh, New Deal from 1935, from the mid-30s, faces today. Uh, I've got to read you this letter. Um, 
brief letter in the uh, uh, New York Times this week. Um, in spite of the prose, the letter is not from an eight-year-old, but uh, purports to be from an adult. I, I quote, your grandfather's Democratic Party isn't going to cut it in a world that has been radically transformed by the internet. The country needs President Obama's leadership to help us look forward and address our economic problems in new ways that are every bit as creative as the New Deal was in its day, but that aren't the same as the New Deal. The world has changed and our political parties need to catch up quick! Exclamation point. The gridlock we've been seeing is a form of hanging on to the past for both the Democrats and the Republicans. Close quote. And we know what's meant there. We're looking forward, as President Obama says, which means cutting these social supports, cutting entitlements. Uh, that's signed by a woman who claims to be a professor of political science at Ohio University, uh, illustrating once again that political science is to science, as military music is to music. In fact, they're both cheerleading. And uh, a little cheerleading for Obama there suggests that we need a new New Deal and that the anti-FBR the anti-FDR, Barack Hussein Obama, is not the one to bring it to us. He's doing just the opposite. So, uh, you are listening to, you are watching, News from Neptune, the new New Deal edition. And uh, we'll talk about some aspects of that as the hour goes on. But we'll start with uh, Ron Zoak. Yes. Uh, choose an outrage, Ron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm calling this uh, Flotsam and the Wave of the Past, <laughs> and uh, uh, I call attention to a longish piece in the New York Times, the U.S. relies on contractors in Somalia conflict. Oh, yes. So these are uh, mercenaries. Uh, the uh, company involved uh, being uh, paid by, it's not clear whether it's the Pentagon or uh, CIA, Bancroft Global Development, an American private security company wow. that the, oh, here it is, the State Department has indirectly financed to train African troops who have fought a uh, pitched urban battle in the ruins of this city in uh, Mogadishu against Shabab, the Somali militant group allied with Al-Qaeda. So this is a group that uh, this article says the United States officials fear could someday carry out strikes against the West. Yeah. So this is a, a preemptive move. They may start thinking at some time in the future about uh, uh, attacking um, the West, whatever that is, and uh, uh, I think we know what they mean. So, um, quoting, we do not want an American footprint or boot on the ground, said Jeez. Johnny Carson, curious <laughs> name, the Obama administration's top State Department official for Africa. That would be bad PR, apparently. A visible United States military presence would be provocative, he said, partly because of Somalia's history as a graveyard for American missions, including the Black Hawk Down episode of 1993, when Somali militiamen killed 18 American service members. So over the past year, the U.S. has quietly stepped up operations inside Somalia. Uh, so, uh, they built a large base at Mogadishu's airport. Somalis call it the pink house for the reddish hue of its buildings or Guantanamo for its ties to the USA. And they've carried out joint interrogations of suspected terrorists with their counterparts in ramshackle, uh, in a ramshackle Somali prison. The Pentagon has turned to strikes by armed drone aircraft to kill Shabab militants and recently approved a $45 million in arms shipments to Africans, African troops fighting in Somalia. So the United States has recently stepped up clandestine operations in Pakistan and Yemen. American officials are deeply worried about Somalia but cannot agree on the risks versus the rewards of escalating military strikes there. Like other security companies in Somalia, skipping here, Bancroft has thrived as a proxy of sorts for the American government. Based in a mansion along Embassy Row in Washington, Bancroft is a nonprofit enterprise run by Michael Stock, a 34-year-old Virginia native who founded the company not long after graduating from Princeton in 1999. 
He used some of his family's banking fortune to set up Bancroft as a small landmine clearing operation originally. Uh, the main figure in the, this account here is a, a French soldier of fortune, uh, Richard Roget, and he denies that he is a mercenary. Uh, and Mr. Stock, Bancroft's president, also flatly rejects the idea that his employees are mercenaries. So, uh, uh, flat denial uh, of uh, the obvious uh, truth. Uh, Apparently the gimmick is they're not being paid directly by the USA, but there are a couple of stops along the way in various uh, Pentagon contractors who are hiring various uh, other subcontractors and so on. And it becomes uh, very um, complicated at some point. I'll move on to uh, Afghanistan if there's time, but uh, meanwhile, okay. back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Ron. I think you put your finger on one of the really important stories this week that, uh, as we know, is uh, being largely ignored by the uh, the rest of the media. Uh, comments or uh, uh, <clears throat> questions on it, David? Well, only that understanding Somalia, like anything else, takes a lot of background going yes. at least back to the Cold War to understand how the United States has has pursued what it perceives that it, it's it's geo, geopolitical in, inter, in, in, interests in 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 Somalia, um, including most recently encouraging Ethiopia to invade Somalia in late two thousand six yes. to overthrow or dislodge the the group that had apparently brought some relative st stability to Somalia after after the tumult of the post-Black right. block, black Hawk Down tumult throughout the 1990s and the first few years of this, of this decade, and that um, it came out in WikiLeaks that, uh, although it had been denied by the United States, that we had encouraged Ethiopia to invade in 2006. It came out, among many other things, in WikiLeaks that in fact we had been involved in that. Ethiopia certainly has its own goals in doing that and its its own uh, regional uh, regional goals, but that was the case uh, that turned out to be the case. Not a big a big surprise, of course. We encouraged them in the sense that we bought them and uh, paid them, and it was it got rather unseemly there for a while because after the Ethiopians had invaded Somalia and had found it a little more difficult than the Americans told them it was going to be, and they thought it was going to be, they came out and publicly said, "Hey, we're not being paid enough for this. You got to pay us more." And uh, the United States was sort of embarrassedly say, "Well, sure, go ahead, but get the job done and try not to talk about it." And, comments from, yeah. yeah, this just one brief comment is that I think in talking about this, you know, often we use maybe we use words in ways that we don't, you know, we don't sort out properly. But one thing that's been pointed out by some commentators in this regard is when does when and how does a drought become a famine? Yeah. There are droughts without famines. Right. Uh, the drought may be whether one wants to attribute it to climate change. That's one issue. But the fact that a famine results from droughts usually is because of the underlying political conflict that obviously prevents food from being brought in and, and so forth. Uh, I think you make an excellent point, too, uh, that the article, even the article, uh, implies, uh, as we imply about Afghanistan, that of course all the U.S. was involved in there a while ago, but then we sort of forgot about it. We let it go and so forth. Yeah. I mean, that's flat false, and if we had any real reporting in this country, we would know that. The United States, the CIA was immensely busy after the Black Hawk Down events, uh, buying one warlord after another, and the, buying the Ethiopians was just the outcome of the fact that they couldn't find uh, a sufficiently strong warlord to back, but they had spent a lot of time and money there uh, with no record, uh, no uh, reporting and uh, very little oversight. Uh, I, I don't mean to suggest the CIA was launched on a, an operation of its own, except in the sense that this was American policy being worked out here. And uh, the accounts, this amazing account of the mercenaries is just an extension of that policy, an extension of the policy the U.S. is using elsewhere. Uh, apparently, Hillary Clinton is going to have her own mercenary army uh, to be part of the occupation of Iraq if uh, the Iraqis are so foolish as to insist that uh, 
uh, the U.S. stick to its timetable of withdrawing from Iraq. One of the ways around that that the U.S. is putting in place right now is to high, high, hire a lot of high-priced killers, like the one this 34-year-old uh, Princeton graduate has put together from his family money, the ones that uh, he's hired, and put them in uh, Baghdad as the American presence. But now, not from the Pentagon, from the State Department, yeah. uh, which is fascinating. Yeah, uh, so, yeah there are uh, actually three actors going on then, the State Department, CIA, and the Pentagon. Right. right. And, uh, um, and there are divisions amongst them. Right, right, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, we'll move on uh, to David. Uh, what's on top of your agenda, David? Well, I'm going to play off um, the letter that you read from the political science professor okay. at Ohio, because that was, as you know, in response to an, a pretty in, inter, inter, interesting article in the uh, New York Times op-ed section, or the, right. the Sunday review section, mm -hmm. as they now uh, have renamed that, uh, by a I guess what you would call a political psychologist uh, named Drew Weston, who wrote an extremely long article about Obama this past Sunday, which I, I actually at first didn't bother to read because I thought it would be sort of same old, same old. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be analyzing, and it was, analyzing yeah. the rhetoric, Obama's right. rhetoric and his gumption and his style and his, his story, his storytelling. And I generally don't like that line of thinking. I still don't like that line of thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that the line of thinking in this article is not the way to go about understanding what's going on. But what was interesting about this article is that it ended with a flourish, which, yes. w which to which was what one, I think, which was w one reason that it got such a response. And they ended up printing eight or nine letters in response to that a few days later, one of which was the one Carl read at the start of the of the show. And what the article ended up by basically saying is that our country is in the toilet. And you don't usually read in the Times. You read a lot of critical things in the Times, but you don't real, really usually read that our country is in the toilet because too few people have too much wealth. Mm -hmm. And um, that struck a nerve. And it was, I think the article was, was a response to, of course, what is perceived as Obama's be betrayal by, uh, with the debt deficit bill and uh, how is, is it that liberals who supported Obama or who continue to support Obama should, um, should respond to that. And I think this was kind of a test case where uh, this gentleman, Drew Weston, was going out on a limb and saying that um, Obama has, you know, not putting it as straightforwardly as you would find on leftist websites, but basically said Obama is a kind of a lost cause. And almost all of the letters that the Times published in the newspaper, first of all, the comments on the article were numerous and yes. were even harsher on Obama by and large than the article itself. But the letters that the Times chose to publish were less harsh, were ranged from sort of going back to the rhetoric of Obama has to find his voice, Obama, you know, the kind of letter that you just read, Carl, and, and, and just out and out defense that Obama has done the best he can given the Republicans, et cetera, et cetera. And I've noted around other places that um, far from this, the debt deficit bill being, uh, you know, sort of being a sign that even liberals must finally recognize what Obama is and has always been, the resistance is still there and is even fortified. Um, one particularly finds this, for example, in an article on the, the, the New Republic uh, website by Jonathan Chait. Um, and so I guess the question that I, I put forth is, um, at long last, w will they ever come to the realization that Obama's, Obama's agenda is what it is, it is what it always has been, and it will continue forward unless people who call themselves liberals and Democrats and who claim to support um, the, the social welfare state that Obama is trying to get rid of uh, come to their senses. 
Yeah, it's it, it's an important piece, I think, in part because of its very disjointedness that you, you talk about, David. Uh, it's almost as if he wrote a piece about Obama's psychology and then ran into that problem that we've talked about here frequently, that uh, it's finally it's not enough to talk about the psychology as people are even to speculate on it. What we're talking about here is politics and whose interests are being served, what groups, what what dominant social groups are in fact doing in the country, and how and what they're doing to cover it up. And the point is to try to understand that and see it. So after all this thing that seems to be about Obama's psychology, he ends with the following lines that you referred to. He, first of all, he picks up one of the more hackneyed quotations from MLK, from Martin Luther King, that is the arc of history bending to justice and so forth. And he says, the arc of history does not bend towards justice through capitulation, capitulation cast as compromise. So Obama psychology again. It does not bend when 400 people control more of the wealth than 150 million of their fellow Americans. Now we're talking politics. It does not bend when the average middle class family has seen its income stagnate over the last 30 years, while the richest 1% has seen its income rise astronomically. It does not bend when we cut the fixed incomes of our parents and grandparents so hedge fund managers can keep their 15% tax rates. See Barney Frank's comment uh, we used at the top of the hour. It does not bend when only one side in negotiations between workers and their bosses is allowed representation. And it does not bend when, as political scientists have shown, it is not public opinion, but the opinions of the wealthy that predict the votes of the Senate. The arc of history can bend only so far before it breaks. Uh, did it break in London this last week, gentlemen? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ron. Your turn to comment on David's. Uh, David's yeah, last well, last that's week. interesting. I have a printout here of the last few paragraphs of that piece by uh, Drew Weston. And uh, there are some interesting uh, phrases in it that I want to repeat. Uh, at the same time, expressing my uh, uh, doubts about. Uh, concentrating on any one person's uh, psychology. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't or, mean to yeah, step or, on your comment. <laughs> yeah, basic uh, uh, beliefs or motivations or uh, whatever it is. But uh, he says, uh, like most Americans, at this point I have no idea what Barack Obama, and by extension the party he leads, believes on any issue. That's a, that's a big difference though. Yeah, yeah. What Barack Obama and... Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, the president tells us he prefers a balanced approach to deficit reduction, one that weds revenue enhancements, enhancements, a weak way of describing popular taxes on the rich and big corporations that are evading them with entitlement cuts, an equally poor choice of words that implies that people who've worked their whole lives uh, are looking for handouts. But the law that he just signed includes only the cuts and so on. Uh, he says then, as a practicing psychologist with more than 25 years of experience, I will resist the temptation to diagnose at a distance. Um, mm. While doing so, of course. Good, yeah. for, well, do it exactly. <laughs> good, good for him. Good for him. Yeah, good for him. yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, the most charitable explanation is that uh, Obama and his advisors have succumbed to a view of electoral su success to which many Democrats succumb that centrist voters like centrist politics. Unfortunately, reality is more complicated, and so on. Uh, uh, a somewhat less charitable explanation is that we are a nation that is being held hostage, not just by an extremist Republican Party, but also by the president, who either does not know what he believes or is willing to take whatever position he thinks will lead to his reelection. Perhaps those of us who were so enthralled with the magnificent story he told in Dreams from My Father appended a chapter at the end that wasn't there, the chapter in which he resolves his identity and comes to know who he is and what he believes in. So uh, still leaving us uh, guessing, does he really stand for anything? Uh, more and more objections are being heard, not only from uh, leftists, but from disillusioned uh, centrists and uh, liberals and so on, that Obama appears passive, timid, and even uh, cowardly on all these big uh, issues in contrast to FDR, who said, uh, uh, all these people are going to hate me and I, I welcome their hatred. Uh, yes. Obama cannot take a position like that. He still talks about bipartisanship and uh, compromise and uh, uh, claiming that uh, the great merit of his uh, um, positions is that uh, everyone is offended by them. So. I, I, I've got, I, I was going to say something else and for my turn here, but uh, you, the point you make is so important uh, uh, that, that I'm going to 
enlarge on that a little. I mentioned that this was the uh, anniversary, this weekend was the anniversary of the signing of the Social Security Act in 1935. Um, and uh, as we look back on the history of the uh, New Deal and the uh, other uh, uh, enactments that uh, parallel the Social Security Act. Uh, we're impressed with that last point that you make, Ron, that, that, that Obama is the anti-Franklin Roosevelt. He's the opposite, to the bizarro Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and it's just, all you have to do is read a little of the history of what actually was done during the Depression uh, and see how the opposite, the opposite is being done. Not just a lack of will, it's not just a, a, a uh, you know, a, uh, fecklessness or something that could be uh, improved with a, uh, you know, a dose of granola or something, um, that in fact what we have here is someone who is working for different interests, who is doing different things. Uh, and uh, that's important. Um, in 1935, uh, and this, you know, Roosevelt had been in office, you know, since the spring of 1933. Uh, 1935, Roosevelt delivered his uh, State of the Union message, the annual message of Congress, and side load he'd like here a, uh, 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 I, I find these days in writing about American politics, and particularly the policies of American presidents, that um, State of the Union addresses turn out to be far more revelatory uh, than um, inaugural addresses. If you read State of the Union addresses, you find that Lincoln, for example, talked about the economic basis for the attack on the South in his first inaugural, in his, not in his inaugural address, but in his first State of the Union address. And that Obama, in his State of the Union, last State of the Union address, said, well, you know, there's a problem with jobs, but we can't deal with jobs right now. We've got to deal with the deficit, buying the deficit nonsense, you know, that was being put about by uh, uh, American propaganda. But in 1935, uh, Roosevelt delivers his State of the Union message, uh, beginning the second phase, if you like, of the New Deal by proposing long-term goals of providing Social Security and better housing and tax reform. All these things were part of the, part of the agenda. The difference with Obama is that he intended to do them, not, intend, not, not as Obama does, to pull them back. Uh, the, one of the most important uh, uh, occurred on the 8th of April. Uh, when the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act established the Works Progress Administration and basically established a program that eventually employed 11 million people, federal jobs doing things that needed to be done, infra, what we now call infrastructure and so forth, straight out federal jobs. This is no business of giving uh, uh, corporations a lot of money, hoping it'll trickle, that, that as a result of having been given all this nice money, uh, the corporation will hire some more people and the jobs will trickle down. No, this was a direct jobs program. Uh, very much needed now. The resettlement administration, uh, that was primarily concerned with farm families, but we need it now in the, for the foreclosure rates being what they are, and the Obama administration having done nothing about it. The rural e electrification administration, once again infrastructure, now family-based. The National Labor Relations Act, this was all that summer. Um, the uh, basically to support unions, Obama's undercutting unions, uh, the Social Security Act in August, I just mentioned, in fact, there was an explosion of New Deal uh, activities in August of 1935, all of which are needed now, uh, but we haven't got. The Banking Act of 1935, uh, which, which controlled the Federal Reserve System uh, via Glass-Steagall, the uh, agreement that, that, that has been removed by the current administration. Uh, the Public Utilities Act, uh, once again, infrastructure matters. And the Revenue Act, which was an increase of tax, uh, taxes on inheritances, gifts, and higher income individuals. Uh, you know, all right. That's what should be. We've got a, we've got a blueprint there, yeah. and what we've got is Barack Obama. And the problem is not his psychology. Yes. The problem is who he's working for, who he's working for. But yeah. look, at the, look at the process by which the first stimulus package, or the stimulus package, the ARRA, was passed during the first couple of years. It was done, it was done as, as a compromise. It was not enough, and then after it was done, it did what it was supposed to do or what all it could do given the money involved. It kept people working. It put some people to work. It, it, it 
countered the, the recession, but there was, there was no effort by the, the Democrats to, to, um, to say, this is working, but we need more, and then, and then they're out of, out of office. Mm -hmm. I mean, then they're out of control of the, of the, of the House. So um, there was a, a, pathetic, a pathetic effort that it was allowed to be framed. If, I hate that yeah. word because it's associated with people I don't agree with. Exactly. But it was allowed to be framed as not working when, in fact, it did work. It worked as well as anyone could say it could work given the, money, the, the money involved. Right. But there was no effort to say we need more of this. I, I agree entirely, and uh, it's uh, we we have people like Paul Krugman uh, give, uh, talking about how this program actually should work, um, but uh, uh, that's that's it's it's almost a. Um, uh, a repressive tolerance that you actually can read a little about this in the New York Times. The New York Times is so much involved in the business of convincing everyone that, oh no, the deficit is the problem. We can't possibly do stimulus things uh, to produce jobs because we got the deficit. You know, uh, what you say it often enough, it works often. It doesn't matter if Krugman over there is actually saying sensible things and saying it in fairly clear prose. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the fix is in. Yeah, uh, the slogan among these uh, media people is that if you say it five times, a lot of people will think it must be true. Maybe we should but, try that. <laughs> <right. laughs> what I tell you three times is true. It's yeah, right, right. Wonderland. Yeah. But yeah. I think Obama, I don't follow what Obama says in his daily life at all, but I can't imagine that he's gone around saying in the, in the months after AARRA started working to the extent that it worked, I can't imagine that he was going around saying, this is working, yeah. let's get more. Uh, exactly he just, right. he, he did what he, he could. He got away with doing very little and still appealing to, to, to liberals as having done something. And he was happy with that. Yeah. Okay, what we need is something like what happened in London in order to, uh, uh, in order to change any of this, right? Yeah. Well, that may be, be coming up. I would like to... Uh, just raise a uh, skeptical note about Carl's interpretation and mention another thing that uh, Drew Weston says, which I think may be right, instead of Obama's innate uh, villainy, perhaps. He says, perhaps like many politicians, so many politicians who come to Washington, he has already been consciously or unconsciously corrupted by a system that tests the souls of, uh, even of people of tremendous integrity uh, by forcing them to dial for dollars. In the case of the modern presidency, for hundreds of millions of dollars. When he wants to be, the president is a brilliant mo and moving speaker, but his stories virtually always lack one element, the villain who caused the problem, who is always left out, described in impersonal terms, or described in a passive voice, uh, as if the cause of others' mem misery has no agency and hence no culpability. Whether that reflects his aversion to conflict an aversion to conflict with potential campaign donors that today cripples both parties' ability to govern and threatens our democracy, or both, is unclear. And, uh, yeah, that sounds mostly right. My only hesitance about that, I think of the line, I think of what Hamlet said when uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were sent to their, uh, uh, their reward. Uh, well, their murder was arranged, basically. Um, and uh, Hamlet's friend objects to that, and Hamlet says, you know, you don't understand, he says, they made love to this employment, the employment in the case being killing Hamlet. Um, and uh, when Obama, we talk about what happened to Obama, well, you know, he's locked into dialing for dollars and so forth. He's made love to this employment. I mean, from the beginning, that's what the, the, the yeah. audacity of hope is about. The yeah. audacity of hope that, uh, you know, I'll get a better job. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, it's possible that he has been so impressed by uh, all of these uh, generals with their chests full of ribbons and medals and so on, and uh, especially his Wall Street uh, campaign uh, contributors, the necessity of pleasing them and so on, that uh, any personal uh, agenda that he might have had along the lines of uh, we're all in this together, which he's said a number of times, has uh, disappeared. And uh, we're all in this now for the uh, uh, benefit 
uh, of the elite in this country, political and economic. That's certainly possible, but I think we should, your, your caution to us frequently not to reflect on the psychology, you know, it's probably helpful here, yeah. but to look at the real politics. And that's, that's where the obfuscation sure. is going. Sure. What in fact is this administration doing yeah. Yeah. and um, what should be done about it? Yeah. Uh, we should remind you, you are watching News from Neptune. Uh, Carl Estabrook, Ron Zoke, and David Green talking about the news of the week and its coverage by the media. And we're trying to go around on a number of different topics. Uh, and it's your deal, Ron, if you want, second hand. Okay. Uh, everyone has heard about the uh, crash of the huge hel helicopter in Afghanistan. It was uh, apparently shot down by a rocket-propelled grenade from someone among the uh, Taliban. Uh, NATO tried to determine on Sunday if Taliban insurgents had shot down the, the troop carrying helicopter in Afghanistan, killing 38 in the largest loss of life suffered by foreign forces in a single incident in 10 years of war. So uh, apparently it has been established that uh, that is indeed what happens. But uh, now we have a uh, story uh, kind of uh, to repair the uh, propaganda yeah. uh, loss uh, there. The helicopter's attackers were uh, killed, and an airstrike takes out two ins uh, takes out the insurgents who downed the U.S. Uh, craft. So they claim to have killed the very one who launched the uh, grenade that brought down the uh, this enormous uh, Chinook helicopter. Uh, this, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, how is that possible yes, for them exactly. to identify the very right. person who pulled the trigger right. Right. Uh, in doing that? That's hey, that, uh, poetic justice. Right, yeah, right. Uh, F-16 fighter jets killed the insurgents responsible on Monday, according to a top American commander in Afghanistan, Marine Corps General, Corps General John Allen, and so on. The military provided few details to back up the claim unsurprisingly, but Allen said he was confident the airstrike killed fewer than 10 insurgents involved in the attack on the U.S. Chinook helicopter. This story from uh, AP goes on to note that the fight is getting more complicated as international troops try to shift more control over Afghan forces. Operations often seem to be Afghan-led in name only, and international troops have repeatedly clashed with their Afghan partners. There have been a host of turncoat shootings by Afghan soldiers of international mm. troops in, uh, in this year. So a number of Afghan tr uh, troops are turning around and uh, shooting NATO soldiers and shooting Americans. Officials said Wednesday that firefights mistakenly broke out between NATO forces and Afghan police in two parts of the country overnight. In one firefight, a southern Kandahar, in southern Kandahar province, four Afghan police officers were killed. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I noted that column, I noted that article that appeared in the News, News Gazette locally, and it came out of the blue, and of course, like you, I couldn't believe it. I made a little note here uh, to, to talk about that. Afghanistan, Afghanistan attack and counter attack. And I, I, I entered it, I entered some keywords into Google News to see well, you know, this is an AP story. W who else covered this? I don't think this was reported seriously in this forthright manner. In, in other words, this military propaganda wasn't repeated in the mainstream media at large. Um, this was obviously really? a choice of a local. I, it was not, I don't believe, in the New, New, New York Times at, at all, or if it was, it was a, a very minor reference, perhaps as a, as a claim. But it wasn't. It wasn't highlighted, unless I'm wrong. Uh, unless yeah. I didn't search right. I, I, um, I that, st that stops me, David, because I, I could, I would have sworn, although I can't yeah. reproduce yeah. it now that I think of it, that the uh, Times also carried the notion that uh, yeah. that they'd got the guy who did it. You know, yeah, right. Uh, up to and including his signed confession. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, right. Uh, yeah. But yeah. then it did, and then there were retractions, and there were. Uh, challenges to the to the to the claim uh -huh. among the, the the Taliban themselves and so forth, um, but still, I mean, the the claim is 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 false on the face of it because they they really just have no way of knowing. I mean, it's it's clear that they it would have certainly no so. way of knowing. Or if they do, that argues a much more a, a, a very different intelligence world, so to speak, uh, than. Um, 
uh, we, we think exists there. Do they really know the people that yeah. they are chasing so well yeah. as to be able to say, oh yes, this is the work of thus yeah. and so, and we can go drop some bombs over there, you know, and probably or rub him out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a second possibility, less likely, I think, than it's a straight out propaganda uh, 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 advance. But I, w I would also just say that I mean, when this happened, I guess I was thinking I was thinking Black Hawk Down. I was yeah. thinking, is this yes. is this going to be something? And you know, it reminds me of what Alexander Coburn said about the Seattle uh, disturbance of, of 99 against the World Trade or, 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 or Organization. He said you could only surprise them every 10 years yeah. or so, or maybe even less often, <laughs> because it's pretty clear to me that the government went into went into high swing to to went into 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 action to make sure nothing like what followed Black Hawk Down in terms of the media coverage happened here. Or more importantly, nothing like what happened to uh, Reagan in Beirut after the, after the 200 Marines were killed there and the result was the withdrawal of those mm -hmm. Marines. I mean, what, what they were trying to forestall was people saying, look, this Afghanistan thing is such a mess, it's costing us the lives of uh, a lot of people and therefore the scaling down should uh, be accelerated, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I had some inter interesting evidence of what was at stake there. I got a note from an ex-student long ago, um, a woman who is not particularly politically involved and not even particularly politically, I think, well informed. I can say this because I won't say who she is. Um, but she sent a note and the event of this, and I'll read you a little of it. Uh, the, the note consisted of the following. 31 lost, 31 unwanted visits, 31 doors that received an, that dreaded knock, 31 families with shrat, shattered hearts, 31 pairs of boots lying, you, you get the drift now, you know. Uh, this went on like this for a while. Um, and uh, uh, so it ends. So take 31 seconds or so to send this note on to reflect on the sacrifice of 31 gone forever. She's talking about the Marines. Now, this, as I say, is not from someone who's particularly interested in politics or follows these notions very much, but is touched by the death of these American soldiers. Uh, now, I mean, she ends, peace to our loved ones. Well, that's, that's important, and I think that was the reaction the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the administration was worried about. Uh, someone else who thought that was uh, Ray McGovern, uh, the ex-CIA man who writes for the uh, veteran, intelli veterans, uh, Intelligence Veterans for Peace. Uh, it's not quite the right title of his group. He wrote a piece entitled, They Died in Vain, Deal With It. And I think he's put his finger on the right point here, that uh, people hearing this story have uh, used it in a inverted fashion, sort of like the thing you were talking about a moment ago, Ron, to, to reinforce the worth of this. Uh, we cannot allow these people to have died in vain, therefore we've got to kill more Afghans. Right, right. That's the level at which this is working in the popular mind, if I can use my ex-student as the popular mind here, and I think that's a very real problem. And it's important that McGovern said what he did. We have to realize, that, yes, they died in vain. They died in vain in the midst of a criminal activity, uh, and that we do indeed have to deal with it. That point keeps coming up again and again, that we have to fight on and kill more in order to vindicate the previous fighting right. and killing and uh, dying. And it's mad uh, on the face of it, but yeah, there are right, people right. who think that way. Yeah. I mean, they, no, a lot of, there's a tendency, there's some people who think that, there's a tendency to think that way in the body politic, and that's yeah. the tendency that uh, the administration is in yeah. some sense counting on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, where are we? Who's, uh, whose deal is it? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry, David. <laughs> I think so. I mean, so yeah, yeah. I'll take uh -huh. my turn. Um, this is actually something I've wanted to bring up for the last couple of weeks, and so I'll finally get around to Good. it. And that is the what's the the uprising, such as it is in is Israel, the, ah. the, <laughs> yes. the local, the not the Palestinian uprising, right. which has been ongoing for for quite a long time. The cottage but cheese the, uprising. The, what's called the tent uprising. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cottage cheese uprising. Among... <laughs> And uh, there's uh, that's uh, that's unfair, but I mean it's it's like calling the Tunisian yeah. thing you know, the yeah. fruit stand uprising yeah. or something because right. it's more important than that. Right. But yeah, but I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a of a, a a different angle on this, 
from the what is people who are representing a pro-Palestinian point of view. Um, I think we have much good writing on talking about what's going on in Israel in relation to, uh, to what's going on in other countries, England and so forth, as a response to economic inequality. Uh, but, there's, uh, but in Israel, of course, you have the Palestinian situation. So you have people on the left at asking, should Palestinians care? Should the pro-Palestinian left care? What should, their, what should their attitude be about what's going on in, in Israel? And what is definitely not a anti-occupation. Right. It's not, it's an economic um, protest, but it's not an anti-occupation protest, even though there are occupation and settlement issues wrapped up in government policies that are, that are being protested. Um, so I think that um, the comment I would, uh, the, the most extreme comment that one can read, and it always the most extreme comment that one can read about these issues, comes from uh, uh, the, the a Angry Arab w website who says, I hate these people and I don't want anything to do with them. <laughs> and I always understand where he's coming from, and I'm not, I'm not even not, not agreeing with them. I'm not, telling, I'm not saying that the Angry Arab should feel any differently given his background and his understanding that's who the angry Arab is, and long, long live the angry, angry, angry Arab. But there are other people who are taking a, a slightly more, let's say, thoughtful view towards this. But it's still a highly critical view, and one, of course, who I, who I often refer to as Max Aj, mm -hmm. who writes at maxajl.com, um, and who is sort of in dialogue with the, with the, the, uh, the, the, le the sort of post-Zionist, anti-Zionist leftist uh, critics in Israel, Jewish, Jewish critics, who write on a, a website called the, the 972. Yeah. Um, and in what, dialogue with is a nice way to put well, it. Well, yeah. in, in, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in, in, yeah. And, yeah. and he writes, uh, there's a certain notion among articulate opinion on the Israeli new left, quote unquote, uh, that Palestinians, Palestine solidarity activists could, should be patting their heads and chuck, chuckling, the, chucking them under the under the chin for mobilizing politically against so, social in, social injustice within Israel or within Jewish Israel. Here's what I think. That is, this is what Max Aj thinks. This protest is good and has caught the the world's the world's attention, and even Palestinian attention, and even Palestinian attention. Palestinians are observing you, meaning Israeli Jews, with caution, optimism, dosed or. De, or, or, or you know, dissolved in pessimism. Most know that there is potential for transformation in these protests, but everyone except for the gullible Anglo-American leftists to whom the J-14's interlocutors are peddling themselves knows that what is occurring could well follow a not unfamiliar script. The, not, the Zionist left asks for solidarity from the society it is murdering, explaining that the victim better note that the boot on its neck, neck has been freshly cleaned, and that it, its owner has the best, the best of intentions and is trying hard to remove its foot and leg from the victim's neck. It's just that something in the quadriceps muscle is intractable. Is that, <laughs> is that the gluteus? Oh, crap. Is it the central nervous system? Perhaps the brain? Could the, could the Zionist left, could even the anti-Zionist left, be responsible for destroying Palestinian society? And then the, he can, concludes, Max, Max uh, Aj concludes uh, by saying Yitzhak Laor, referring to a, a, a leftist uh, person that he usually quotes, quotes approvingly, uh, Yitzhak Laor wrote once that the overriding sentiment he as an Israeli felt when confront, confronted with Palestinian society was shame. That, and then Max Aj says, that seems about right to me, and I don't excuse myself from that feeling of responsibility and shame. It's American tax dollars that pay for the bombs that bo bombard mm -hmm. Gaza. Yeah, this is... Uh, <laughs> David, do you think that uh, um, the reactions to the uh, events in London this week and the reactions to the events in Tel Aviv um, uh, can be paralleled. Um, I'm saying that quite the way I want to. What, I'm, what I want to suggest is 
is there a possibility that both uprisings, such as they are, uh, in Israel and in England, um, are capable of uh, further development in a politically progressive fashion? I mean, uh, you know, or is it just as the as the British Prime Minister says, pure criminality? And as the, uh, uh, a lot of the people who dismiss what's going on in Tel Aviv, it's a yuppie revolt. Uh, you know, uh, what are the potentialities here in either place, and are they different? They may be, in fact, I mean, are we wrong to see uh, some sort of similarity here in an Israeli summer and, uh, you know, a, a London fall? Uh, yeah. I, would autumn, just, autumn, I, would, say. I would briefly answer that by saying that, that I, I, you know, ironically, because the Israeli protest is broader and more deeply rooted, and wasn't necessarily precipitated by an event per se, or well, the Kaddishis, <laughs> but still, but not in not a police not a police event in yeah, quite yeah. the same way, uh -huh. that it, it would seem to have more promise. But what undermines that is the nature of Israeli society uh -huh. and the nature of its uh -huh. beholdenness to the to militarism and the occupation. Mm -hmm. But what makes me more pe also pessimistic about the British uprising is that it is it is a a race it is also a racial uprising, and therefore I suspect that it will be easily defused on the base on the conquer and on the divide and conquer basis of racialism. We're talking about... In Britain? Yeah, in Britain. We're talking I about... Think, a, a, I think that's been oversold. I, surely it's less racial than... Well, I, uh, maybe you're right, and I, I, I hope you are, and of uh, course I hope it has broad support, but I just see it as something well, that can be, can be diffused because you get, the, you get the dynamic there, for instance, between the Asian, the, pa the Pakistani aspects who are defending their property against these these use and yeah. once you get that involved then the people start to say well what about this and I I see less promise for that growing into a broad movement but she's this is where it seems to me that the that race uh, confuses things. I mean, we're familiar in America uh, the way in which uh, that our inability to talk about class means that most class questions have to be transferred into race questions, yeah. and that usually leads to misapprehension of what's going on. Um, strangely enough, uh, although the uh, uh, rhetoric of class is certainly different in Britain, I think in this case something like that is happening when we see these the, the London events as as racial. They aren't. These are these are class. These are class incidents. Now, I don't mean to suggest that um, the old men in the British Museum spent a lot of time talking about when uh, a class became, uh, went from being a class an sich to a class für sich. And what he meant by that is a, a, a class in fact to a self-conscious class. You know, well that surely hasn't happened in, in Britain. The people who are talking about that are being so remarkably uh, 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 treated with such contempt by the BBC who are writing nothing because they want new trainers. I've heard that again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember when the British say trainers, they don't mean somebody who works in the gym, you know, they mean tennis shoes. Uh, but they, 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 the BBC has been incredible about this. It's not racism, it's classism. And the most virulent classism that I, I mean more virulent than I would have expected they'd get away, they'd get away with. The BBC a reporter spent a, a, a large amount of time the other morning uh, haranguing a poor woman in Tottenham about the fact, wasn't it up to the parents to keep their kids indoors and out of this sort of trouble? Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, this is the line that's being taken. The class animosity and the, uh, the, the willingness of the British establishment to suppress uh, a class that is indeed struggling to a sense of itself here uh, is not to be believed. They, they, they want to cut off the internet. They want to cut off social media because the problem is these people are using... The BBC <laughs> reporter who said, you know, he says the notion that these are poor people is nonsense. He says, why, I saw one looter get into a car and he was carrying a telephone better, a, a cell phone better than the one I own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, better than a BBC reporter owns. <laughs> You know, now, when we have reporting on this level, it seems to me it's very easy to mistake 
the class and other aspects of this, uh, uh, of this affair. I'm not sure that we're at all clear about them, but what I don't think is, I don't think it's a racial uprising. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not saying it actually is in that sense, but that, you know, again, it's being framed yes, <laughs> in indeed, that yes. sense. And the question is whether that will work yep. with the British population at, at large in, in so far as how the broader political uh, aspects of it are going to work into whether into what the response to this is going to is going to be. But I'm still not I'm still I don't see the answer about mm -hmm. uh, if I understand your your mm -hmm. answer the similarities between what's going on in Tel Aviv and what going uh, mm -hmm. going on in London is uh, vitiated by the differences in the societies. Um, the the the, the well, boost. Just, it's a it's a kind of con it it is a kind of contrast. Uh -huh. in a, I mean. In, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm all for having a class-based uprising in either society <laughs> and calling it that and people there calling it that because uh -huh. that's, you're right, that's what it is at bottom. Of course, that's what it is. Um, we should uh, uh, say our goodbyes, I'm afraid. You've been watching News from Neptune on UPTV for the 32nd week of 2011. Uh, I, I got to my hand on the, uh, in the third round here. I would have uh, read you a letter that appeared in this morning's News Gazette. Uh, and uh, so we begin with letters to the editor and in a sense end with letters to the editor. Uh, but uh, we sh just have time to point out to you that our program News from Neptune is named in honor of Noam Chomsky. Uh, and this has been the, uh, not the letters to the editor edition as it could have been, but the new New Deal edition, uh, what's needed, what's necessary. If our program is interested to you, you might want to look at these programs heard regularly throughout or seen regularly throughout each week on UPTV. Uh, White House Chronicles, Sundays mor Sunday mornings at 7 a.m., repeated during the week. Democracy Now! every weekday at 7 a.m. Uh, the Big Picture with Tom Hartman every weekday at 8 a.m. Labor's Worldview with David Johnson and Jim Iman, Sundays at 4 p.m. And The David Pakman Show, Saturdays at 7 a.m. and repeated through the week. I'm Carl Esterwick. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zilk and David Green. This and other editions of this program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I can be reached at Carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook, and I'm happy to receive your comments. And I particularly appreciated the comment from the ticket taker at a crowded art theater the, the other night, uh, who stopped in the midst of this, to the dismay of some of those people anxious to get into the new Woody Allen picture, uh, and uh, told me that uh, he enjoyed what we do on this program. I appreciated that very much. My thanks to our director, Jason Liggett. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune, and in the meantime, a confusion to our enemies and a good night to you.